I have conducted over 30 data science interviews and I've also done around 50 myself. So in this video, I want to break down my top interview advice from both sides of the table. Let's get into it. Interviewing at five places increases your chance of landing a role than just interviewing at one place. You don't need to be a genius to work that one out. I often tell my mentees and aspiring data scientists that interviewing is purely a numbers game. There are so many things that can go wrong. Like you may be having a bad day, haven't slept well, so you just don't perform well, to be honest, in an interview. Your interviewer may be also be having a bad day and you just don't vibe together. You may be asked a question that you simply just don't know the answer to. Or you miss your train, you miss your bus, wherever it is, and you don't make it to the interview on time. All these things can happen. So I encourage you to play the odds and interview at multiple places to increase your chances of landing that first role. If you want some inspiration, I applied for over 300 jobs before I landed my first graduate data scientist position. So I really know what it means to play the game. In fact, I have a whole podcast explaining this process, which I'll link in the description below. I've had it so many times where I'm trying to help and guide a candidate, but they just don't seem to be like listening to me or responding to what I'm trying to say. I understand why this happens. You're nervous, anxious, and you really want to make a good effort that you kind of get paralyzed or you're not really listening or in a very relaxed environment to take in this new information that the interviewer is trying to give you. But my main advice is just take a deep breath. If the interviewer is speaking to you, particularly when it comes to a technical or coding interview, listen to them because their guidance is normally pretty good and telling you what you need to do. So again, listen to them. It's probably more detrimental to the interview if you don't listen to them because it builds this quite negative and like hostile atmosphere almost. So like I said, listen attentively and take their suggestions on board. One of the main skills we look for in interviews is that is this person receptive? Can they listen and kind of implement what you're telling them? because that's just a really good kind of skill to have and it shows that you're collaborative, which like I said, is what we look for. Nothing is worse than a candidate simply just doing the question but not explaining exactly what they're doing or why they're doing it, particularly when it comes to technical and coding interviews. I personally always play back the question to the interviewer to make sure I fully understood what the question is asking. And then I'll kind of discuss exactly how I'm planning to solve it and the things I'm going to try. The reason I do this is for the following. I want to make sure the question I'm going to answer is indeed the correct question that is being asked. Allow myself to think through how I'm going to respond and logically approach the problem. To demonstrate my thorough problem solving skills and how I approach problems in a systematic way. So take your time and walk through what you're going to do. Not only is this better for you, but it's 10 times better for the interviewer because they're clear on exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the approach you're going to take. And that clarity in communication is really invaluable and something they look for during this interview. I remember I was sat in an interview where someone asked a candidate about their past experience or just past work. And the candidate literally spoke for like 10 minutes. And I mean, that's great and you're clearly enthusiastic, you have a lot to say, and you clearly have a lot of experience, but 10 minutes, it's just overkill. It doesn't need to be that long. The point of an interview is to be more of a conversation, so you kind of get the vibe of the person, the kind of work we're doing at a company, X, Y, Z. So allow kind of breaks or breaths when you're speaking or responding. And whatever you do, I don't recommend answering any question that's 10 minutes long, or at least don't just talk for 10 minutes. Make sure there's like breaks where the interviewer, like I said, can ask questions, can more interject and kind of ponder more of what you're saying. So just don't be fully verbaling everything out. Respond in a kind of succinct way so that you're getting the core message across the least amount of words because not only is this better for the interview, but there's so much time to go through every single thing that you want to talk about. So take your time, take breaths, speak in a concise way because like I said, that will make the interview so much better. Interviews, in a way, are like a game. They don't necessarily cover all the skills you need for the job, and that's quite hard to do. So you've got to try and learn how the game is played to increase your chances of landing an offer. There is a common meme in the tech industry about leak code and how leak code is not really job related, but it's just used for filtering out candidates. This is partly true. 
But tech companies need some way of narrowing down their talent pool really on in the process. And lead code is kind of like the best thing we have in the moment to do that. It tests your ability to write working code in a short space of time and also how you communicate and structure your problem solving skills, which is something we discussed earlier. I am not saying go and grind lead code day in, day out for next year, because particularly for data science interviews, there's not really needed. But it's just to illustrate an example of knowing how the game is played and optimizing for that game, because like I said, that will increase your chances of getting that role. I recommend you check out Ryan Petersman's newsletter on why lead code is used by tech companies. He's a staff software engineer at Meta, so he probably knows what he's talking about. Little things make a difference and compound. Doing things 1% better really gives you the edge. Two things that require no skill but are really important is one, showing up to the interview on time and being punctual, and two, looking presentable and just dress kind of nicely for the interview. Sure, if you're the perfect candidate and you smash the interview process, but you show up five minutes late, chances are this will very unlikely impact whether you get a job or not. But why play on the risk? Most people probably won't care if you show up late. But what happens if you just get that one interviewer who punctuality is a big deal for? Not to mention, if you're late, you're probably a bit stressed, anxious because you're late, and that probably won't allow you to perform. So again, it requires no skill, just show up to your interview on time, and I promise the whole experience will be so much nicer. By dressing appropriately, I'm not saying that you need to wear a three-piece suit. Like, you don't need to do to that extent. But maybe put on a shirt, ensure that, you know, like have a shower or look like you haven't just woken up a bed and your hair is everywhere. Like just look presentable as if you're, you know, showing off for a date or something like that. You know what I mean? I know some people may say that, oh, well, it doesn't really matter how you look like. It should be your skills and, you know, it's like a bias, whatever. And yes, true. But in reality, the world we live in, first impressions matter. So again like i say you don't need to be like so you know like in a suit so dressed up no just look presentable look like you're made an effort for the day and it goes a long way with the interviewer i promise you these little things require no skill but they really make a big difference so show up on time and look presentable many people including myself probably put too much focus on the technical aspects of the interview which makes sense because our job as data scientists is pretty much maths and coding heavy. So that's kind of the main things we focus on and that's probably the main things we think the interviewers look for. When in reality, the behavioral or the soft skills interview is probably what makes you stand out more compared to other candidates. At a certain point, your technical skills are probably sufficient for most roles. It then comes down to how you go about your work, how do you interact with the company and people, just all the soft skills that make you a well-rounded professional. My friend Mandy Liu has a whole newsletter article about how she got promoted before she even started a job. And that was mainly due to her behavioral interview. Because what happens as you move up the ranks is less a question of your technical abilities, but it's more about literally your behaviors, and how you go about working, collaborating, all these things I just said. And the more senior you are, the better your behaviors are. And so they're really important because you could get promoted before you even start the job like Mandy did. In fact, the opposite can happen and you can even be down leveled because of your behavioral skills. Steve Quinn, who's a principal engineer at Amazon, even has a whole video demonstrating this. So focus equally on your technical and behavioral interviews to optimize your chance of getting a job. I have a previous video explaining exactly how you should prepare for your data science behavioral interviews. I'll link your screen here in case you want to check it out. If you enjoyed this video and you want more data science advice like this, then make sure you check out my weekly newsletter, Dictionary Data. I send it every Monday morning and it's all about my thoughts and experiences as a practicing data scientist. If that sounds interesting, I'll leave a link in the description below for you to check it out.